Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Take Charge, Advanced Care Planning Tips. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online resource center, FCA Care Journey, please visit caregiver.org. So today I'd like to welcome our guest, Mary Matisson. Mary is the Chief Strategy and Integration Officer at Mission Hospice and Home Care in San Mateo. Mission Hospice and Home Care is one of the original and still independent nonprofit hospices in California. Mary has led awareness initiatives on end-of-life issues internationally and supports the innovative educational offerings at Mission Hospice, as well as her passion for engaging partners to co-create more compassionate communities for those living with serious illness, death, and bereavement. So now, now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Mary. Thank you, Calvin, and thank you to the Family Caregiver Alliance, and welcome everyone on this webinar. Um, we have been working with Mission Hospice and Family Caregiver Alliance for the past few years, along with a number of agencies across our service area in San Mateo and northern Santa Clara counties in California to raise awareness about advanced care planning through this Take Charge initiative. So I'm, I'm grateful for the time to be able to speak to all who are on the call today. Um, this is a big topic and we're going to dive in um, with some tips and then I'll be happy to take as many questions as possible at the end as you mentioned, Calvin. Next slide, please. So, uh, Mission Hospice is involved in this um, as I, I am personally because Providing the best quality care for someone um, for their last days of living is something that touches every one of us personally and um, with those that we care for. And the first question to consider for yourself around advanced care planning um, is why it matters to you. Why, if you just consider for a moment as you're on this call today, why are you here? Why does this topic matter to you? Is it for your own care? Is it because you're caring for someone else? Um, these are the questions to start with because in addition to this being a, a universal conversation with the tips that I will share with you, it's a very personal and intimate conversation. And most of us have personal experiences around this topic, around the care of someone that we love or around our own serious illness. Um, and coming to why the conversation matters to you, what your hopes and fears are, is a great place to begin. Next slide. And why this matters nationally, um, actually 90% of the public say that talking about end of life is important, but only fewer than 30% have done so. And many people expect that their doctors will raise the conversation when it's time. Um, but a recent survey shows that nearly 90% of doctors aren't comfortable starting the conversation with people uh, about what their wishes would be for their end of life care. The best way that we have found to do, to start the conversation with your physician is to literally take charge and um, go in and start the conversation with them about what matters to you. And just before we go to the next slide um, so that everyone is on the same page, Advanced care planning is a process that helps you decide and document what kind of care you would want or not want if you have a health crisis and you're not able to make decisions or communicate for yourself. Um, so this is something that unfortunately none of us knows when that time might come and why we need to plan ahead. So um, as we go through this uh, webinar and um, and afterwards you can access your free toolkit that we have worked on locally to put together all the steps that are in this presentation are in the toolkit and you can download it there at missionhospice.org take charge next slide so advanced care planning um, actually falls for simple steps thinking about what matters most to you talking about your wishes with your family and friends choosing your healthcare agent, and writing it down and sharing your plan. The steps are simple. 
the content can be very emotional and um, require some significant questions and learning on your part to actually be able to communicate what matters most. And the first step, thinking about what matters most to you, is what um, traditional courses on advanced care planning tends to skip. They tend to go straight to the forms, and if you're on the call wondering what to do about filling out the forms, we'll get there. Um, but the first step is really considering what matters um, for your own care and what your wishes and values are. Next slide. So step one, think about what matters most to you and the kind of care you would want if you were unable to speak for yourself. And there are a number of tools that can help you do this. This is just um, for today. We'll cover a couple of tips. And on the next slide, there are some sample phrases that matter to people as um, research has shown what matters most to people either as they're facing end-of-life care or have been caregivers. And at the bottom of this slide, the source is uh, Go Wish, and these you can actually go onto their website and see almost like a solitaire game of looking at different phrases on these cards or have, uh, they also make a deck of cards. But these simple phrases, to be free from pain, to be kept clean, to maintain my dignity, you reflect for a moment, are any of these things values or wishes that matter most to you if you couldn't speak for yourself and you were seriously ill, if you couldn't speak for yourself and you were approaching the end of your life, what would matter most to you? And I completely understand that this can be very emotional and many people looking at these will remember the care of a loved one and what mattered to them. Next slide. These are some of the other phrases. And also experiences that you've had with caring for someone who was seriously ill or being with someone who was dying. What are the things, do you know things that you would absolutely want for your own care? or you would absolutely never choose, and you would want to make sure those things are communicated. The question mark at the bottom of this, in the deck of cards and on their website, there is a wild card. And so if there's something that you've always known mattered to you, um, to be very comfortable for some people in workshops that we deliver locally, sometimes people will have a pet that they want to make sure is cared for. Um, some people have a favorite food or prefer a bath over a shower or um, one woman in a workshop I facilitated had a rock star funeral plan and she wanted to make sure people knew what the specifics were in that so that she could achieve what mattered most to her. So thinking about what matters most to you, thinking about what quality of life means to you. Is there uh, something that you can imagine in uh, illness or uh, a future state that you would not that you would not have the quality of life that matters most to you even if you wake up in the morning and think about what gives you quality of life today it may be family or nature it may be a spiritual or religious practice it may be friends it may be being able to be as mobile as possible. These things can change over time, but thinking about this as we're doing our advanced care planning can help those around you understand how best to deliver any kind of care. So step one is think about what matters most to you, and these are just some tips to get you thinking. There are more questions in the toolkit that's online. Next slide. Step two is talking about your wishes with your family friends, and your doctor. In talking about your wishes, you need to know what some of those are, which is why step one is so important. Um, talking about your wishes, there are um, three groups of people that you want to consider in talk, speaking with. One, family and friends, those closest to you, who might be near or who might be um, those who would be called if there was a crisis situation or that you would want to know. And the reverse of that is think about those that you care about, 
do you know what their wishes are? So your closest circle of family or friends, your physician, you want to make sure any physicians who are currently caring for you, um, if you have a general practitioner or um, any specialists that are caring for you, and third, anyone who's likely to be involved in your future health care decisions, and we'll get to that more specifically in step three. So your wishes can be your beliefs and values or your wishes such as in slides for step one. Your wishes may be specific medical treatments that you would or wouldn't choose, and those can be clarified in conversations with your care providers or physician as well. So as we're only on step two here, I will just um, pause for a moment and remind everyone that although advanced care planning is often considered the end result of the form, there are multiple conversations that take place in order to clarify what matters most to you and then communicate it so those around you can be part of your care. One of the key um, stumbling blocks that people often find, even those who have done advanced care planning, is how to start that conversation with their family um, or with their friends or even with their physician. And uh, in the toolkit I mentioned, there are a couple of simple ways to do this. Um, one is just to suggest, consider if there's ever been an experience in your family or your circle of friends that something went terribly wrong with the care of someone. Unfortunately, many of us have these experiences. So given that, um, maybe someone had care that, that they wouldn't have wanted. Um, people have family member experiences where they say, you know, he would never have wanted that or she would never have wanted that because we haven't had that conversation. So a couple of ways to start. Thank you for the slide. Um, even though I'm okay now, I want us to be prepared for the future. Another that's not on the slide, do you remember what happened to aunt or uncle so-and-so and his family when he was sick? I don't want that to happen to us. Can we please have a, sit down and have a conversation about this? And the simplest is I went to a workshop or webinar today and they said we should all talk about our wishes for medical care. So again, coming back to why this conversation matters to you, thinking about your wishes and values, and starting to have those conversations with those around you um, are important. And there are a couple of resources available online, uh, the Conversation Starter Kit and the Stanford Letter Project that are both listed in the toolkit. So starting the conversation is important um, once you know some of the things that matter to you. And step three is choosing your health care agent, someone you'd want to make the decisions about your care if you weren't able. And this is really one of the key, key goals of advanced care planning is to identify someone who you would want to make decisions about your care if you were unable to. And this is important for a couple of reasons. In medical or system speak, um, your health care agent is the person who legally is designated by you for the health care teams to have conversations about your medical situation and to make decisions on your behalf. There are a lot of confidentiality regulations about all of our healthcare records, and medicine, uh, medical professionals are not by law allowed to discuss those specifics or share that information unless someone is legally designated to do so. So when we take charge of our advanced care planning, we name that person who can be the person who would speak for us if we couldn't speak for ourselves. And it's very important to remember that the only time your advanced care plan or this decision maker comes into play is if we can't speak for, excuse me, if we can't speak for ourselves, if for any reason 
something were to happen where um, either for short term or permanently there was an accident, uh, a heart condition, a stroke, um, something that would make us unable to be able to speak for ourselves or to think clearly enough to be able to communicate for ourselves. And in those situations, in an emergency situation, your healthcare agent is the person named to be able to make those decisions for you. Now, unfortunately, um, many people think we can just put someone's name on this form and it's done. But if you imagine that you are someone's healthcare agent, which I certainly have been and many of you on the, the webinar may have been in your own life, the only way the healthcare agent can be informed enough to make decisions on your behalf is if you talk with them about what that would mean. So step three is really important about who you might choose and then making sure that you're communicating with this person, A, to see if they'd be willing to be your healthcare agent, and B, to see if they would support the things that matter most to you because your healthcare agent is actually an advocate for you and in the best circumstances is actually just following what your wishes would be. They're not put in um, a burdensome position, although it's a, a big task. Um, it is made much easier if your agent actually understands how you would think in certain situations, and that's where the conversation comes in again. So choosing a good healthcare agent, next slide. You want to choose someone who knows your wishes and values, someone who knows you well, if possible. That's not always possible, but that is, um, if it is, someone who knows you, someone who knows what matters most to you, someone who would respect your wishes even if they're different from your own. And with certain treatment options, with certain care decisions, um, with certain family dynamics, you want to make sure that um, even if your healthcare agent's wishes are different than yours, that they would be willing and able to honor yours. And this is one of the rare conversations in life where uh, 100 of us, if we were born, this is a conversation that will impact our lives um, for those we love and for ourselves. So your healthcare agent um, will need to be considering this for themselves as well as for you. Your healthcare agent should be someone you trust, and most people choose a spouse or a partner, relative, or a close friend as their agent. Um, a healthcare agent does not need to be a relative, and it's really important that um, one of the things I often say is if your healthcare agent is someone who wouldn't return a meal in a restaurant if it wasn't up to, if it wasn't warm enough, or it wasn't up to something that they would like. They may not be the best person to advocate in a crisis situation with healthcare professionals on your behalf. Um, just because someone knows you well, you need to also look at can they be calm in a crisis? Would they ask questions on your behalf? Um, can they be a strong advocate? And many people. Um, have multiple people they'd like to be involved in decision making or in gathering information or being there as a support. That's fine, but legally you must choose and designate one healthcare agent because remember this is a legal designation that the healthcare teams will know this is the person who has the authority to have access to the medical information and decision making. Finally, California law states that your agent cannot be your current health care provider or a staff member in your care facility. So once you've decided who you'd like to serve as your agent, this kind of goes back and forth with step two and ongoingly, ask them if they're willing. Ask, sit down and talk with them about what your wishes are. Um, if you've started to complete or have completed your advanced directives, many people have them in files or with an attorney somewhere and they've never actually gone through the exercise of talking through this with someone. The only way we really get peace of mind around this is to make sure that those closest to us will honor um, and we are assured that they understand what matters to us and would do everything um, in their ability to honor that. 
So you talk to your agent about your questions, your answers, um, the wishes and values, the medical treatments that you might or might not want. And the last step is to put all of these things in writing. Step four is to write all of this down and document your decisions and share these with your healthcare agent, your doctor, and your loved ones. There's one other thing I want to go back to on the healthcare agent. Um, the recommendation is to have at least one or two alternates for the person you designate as your health healthcare agent. Um, someone might not be available at the a moment in time. Um, for a number of reasons, they might not be able to be reached, so it's always a good idea to have more than one person. Um, and on the form, there is a place to put alternates. I'm happy to answer more questions about this um, at the end. So step four is to, now you've done all this hard work. You've, you've thought through the things that matter. You've thought about quality of life. You've thought about medical decisions. Um, you've talked to those closest to you, and you've chosen a healthcare agent. Again, the medical system looks to forms. And the form is the advanced directive. So in the next slide, documenting your wishes are on a document called an advanced healthcare directive. There is another document called a Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. And in different states, these forms have different names, but I will go over both of those now. And then once it's documented, you need to make sure you're sharing your plan in the way that can ensure that you've done the most that you can do to make sure those around you and those responsible for your care would have access to this information. So in documenting your wishes, next slide, there are a number of different advanced healthcare directives. Um, there are multiple versions. They all have the same goal. As a legal document, the goal is to designate your healthcare agent. And as a document stating your wishes and values and preferences for your care, that's the place that when it's in writing, everyone can um, look to and have that in the same place. The number one goal for your healthcare directive from the medical perspective and the legal aspect of your advanced healthcare directive is the naming of your healthcare agents. So in these forms, although they have multiple forms and some go into more depth about subtleties of wishes and values, um, lots of details about the kinds of care you would or wouldn't want, lots of things about um, spiritual or religious beliefs and values and things that can bring you comfort and music and um, sense and uh, all sorts of things, subtle things that you might want a friend or family member to know. And others, the California state document is, as you can imagine, um, and in every state there is a very basic, very legal, very non-warm and fuzzy form, um, but it gets the same, um, the basic information captured. Also, that's important to note is that many health insurances now um, and some hospital systems require their own form. And I know this only makes it more, more um, confusing for the public, um, but as I said, if you cover these basics, basic steps of information, you're naming your healthcare agent, you're naming your alternates, you're stating the basic wishes around medical treatments that you would choose or not choose. And there are places in all to add as many or as few details as you prefer um, about your wishes and values and care and the decision making you would make. On the advanced directive, um, the final key on the advanced directive form, the Advanced Healthcare Directive. On that form, it is a legal document once your signature is witnessed by two witnesses or it's notarized by a notary. 
You do not need an attorney to complete an advance directive. So any of us can do this on our own, so long as we have capacity to make these um, decisions and have our signature witnessed, which is also why it's imperative that we do this in advance of need or crisis, especially for anyone who may have a diagnosis or um, a known condition where mental capacity might be challenged in the future. It's where advanced directives come in um, very significantly in, in ensuring people's care is aligned to their wishes. Next slide. The POLST form, and I know it's a national call, so it's also referred to as MOLST, um, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, the Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. This form comes into effect for emergency medical treatment outside of the hospital. Your advanced directive, which is the form that we've just talked about, is a form where hospital personnel, um, if someone is brought into emergency or you're in a hospital um, or you're under medical care, the emergency hospital personnel will be um, finding out who your health care agent is and what your statements of wishes and preferences are so that they can start conversations with your health care agent. The Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment is a document that was developed um, with much legal and medical input um, to ensure that people's wishes outside of the hospital, if you are living with a serious medical condition um, and you have strong wishes for your care, specifically around CPR or different medical interventions, Legally, the only way emergency personnel cannot deliver cardiopulmonary resuscitation or full, full code care because their job in an emergency is to do everything possible to revive someone. And in certain conditions for the very frail elderly with someone living with a terminal illness, when someone is on hospice care um, and they're still living at home, if you're living with a, a chronic or critical illness that you know certain treatments or things you wouldn't want, this form is where you go to your doctor, have that conversation, and your physician is the only one who can sign this form. It is literally a physician order, and that order tells any emergency personnel that that physician is ordering them not to provide those treatments or to provide those treatments. So this is a conversation with you and your physician and your physician signs it. Alternately, in the reverse, the, the slide before with your advanced directive, that's a document that you can complete on your own. And if you have any questions about these, because everyone has different um, specifics for your own medical care and treatment, it's highly recommended that you start the process of considering these things and schedule an appointment with your physician so that you can go over these. And uh, most recently, Medicare has changed its rules and allows for physicians to bill them for these appointments. So it's recommended you schedule a, a separate appointment with your physician and to say that you want to go over these forms or your questions about these, um, and especially the physician order for life-sustaining treatment is the form that must be completed and can only be completed by your physician. So I'm sure there's a number of questions about that, which we will answer in the Q&A. So in summary, if we move to the next slide, Um, this is a lot of information quickly, um, and we'll go to the questions in just a moment. But just to summarize, the four steps are to think about what matters most to you, talk with your family, friends, those closest to you, anyone directly involved in your care, 
and specifically choosing your healthcare agent and considering and continuing that conversation um, with your healthcare agent. Make sure you write down and designate your healthcare agent and your advanced directive, any of your uh, key wishes and statements to follow and complete those forms. And your advanced directive needs to be witnessed by either two witnesses or notarized. If you are living with a serious condition um, and have other concerns about emergency care outside of the hospital, you would speak to your physician about whether or not a pulsed or MOLST form is appropriate for you. And that would be in discussion and a signed form with your physician. And this is a cycle because any of these things can change over time. Um, you can change your mind so long as you are able. Um, these can change and we recommend that you review these documents and your decisions anytime there's a change in diagnosis. If you, um, if you have a change in uh, location, if you have a change in any of your healthcare agents, we often do workshops um, around this topic and people said, oh yes, I've done an advanced directive and it's in a file, I did it 10 years ago, and when they pull it out, A, they've not talked to their healthcare agent, and B, their healthcare agent either is no longer living or may not be um, capable anymore. Um, so it's these are things to review, just like um, if you have a will, it's recommended that you review and update um, maybe at every five-year mark, or like I said, if you have a change in your personal health condition with your health care agent, or in your family circumstances, many have named some, a spouse, and then if there is a divorce, they may or may not want that person still making health care decisions for them. And the final step in this, um, before I open it up to questions, um, is where do you put these forms, and how do you ensure that they can be accessed um, that's another area that you really need to take charge of. Um, just because you've done them doesn't mean that anyone else knows that unless you have taken actions to ensure that. So you want to make sure your healthcare agent has a copy. You want to make sure any physicians that are currently treating you um, or your GP has a copy. And in most healthcare um, hospital systems, uh, insurers now, I know Kaiser and uh, um, when you go in for an appointment or in their medical record system, you can request that a copy be put in your medical record. Um, so that can be done specifically and you can ensure then that that's your advanced health care directive or your POLST or both are in your medical record with medical systems. For the POLST form, you need to make sure um, it's actually on a hot pink form and in the age of technology that is the um, the most uh, non-technical way that emergency personnel uh, and systems so far have found to keep a hot pink form on your refrigerator if you um, are at home because uh, if emergency personnel come in the house they know that's where to look um, my own mother had one on her refrigerator door. Um, it's recommended that you also, if um, it's something that both of these, if you're living with a condition or have concerns about people being able to access this, Medic Alert also has bracelets um, that are specific for healthcare directives. There are a lot of things online. Um, if you look, there are a lot of places and, and people trying to figure out best ways to have these forms accessible. Um, and if you, uh, it's, it's a good idea if you have a cell phone um, in the uh, emergency access area on your cell phone, you can note that you have an advanced healthcare directive and or a post or keep photos of them in that section on your phone. You can keep them in your glove compartment. If you travel, you can keep them with you and alert um, people in an area that you go to that you have these. And finally, the most foolproof way that I have seen um, to date is an 85-year-old gentleman that was in one of the workshops I was facilitating who actually kept both documents, small copies of them, 
uh, folded in a lanyard under his button-down shirt, and he didn't leave the house without them. Um, so if anyone had to uh, do emergency services with him, that, that would be the first thing they would see. Um, so it, there are humans involved at every step of this, and the, the best peace of mind and assurance is having the conversations and ensuring the documents are complete and people know what's in them and you have made sure that a physician, um, your physician, your healthcare service, and your family or healthcare agent have copies of these. And you can update them um, simply by keeping a list of who has them now and supplying them with an updated version when and if you update them. So with that very fast tour of advanced care planning, um, it is critical to not assume that these things will be done for you, um, not assume that the conversation will be started by someone else, um, but really, uh, and if you're on this call, you already have the courage to learn more about it and take charge of this for yourself. And I can say from both working in a hospice um, and also being the healthcare agent for both of my parents um, and um, and going through this process for my own advanced care planning, it truly does give the most possible peace of mind around um, people being supported to honor what matters most to you in what's a very important chapter of our lives. So with that, I'll open up to questions, and I know there's some in the chat. Calvin, how would you like to do this? Perfect. Thanks so much, um, Mary. Uh, I guess maybe we could do it if you would like to answer some of the chat questions you think, and then I can also add some of the other questions we've had uh, readers send us over uh, the registration process. Wonderful. Okay, let me just see which questions. Um, uh, yes, it's possible to get a PDF of today's slideshow. Um, does the advanced healthcare directive require to be notarized? No, it can, they, there can be a witness, um, two witnesses of your signature. So as you're signing your healthcare directive, having two witnesses in our workshops, strangers can witness, if they're witnessing the signature, not the content, so you can keep the content private. Um, you can have friends or family members. We've had people go out to dinner with each other and, and each witness the signature of their advanced health care directive. If for any reason you don't have two people that you would like to witness your signature, um, you can have it notarized, but either is work will, will work. Um, what is a DNR form? Um, a DNR form, it, DNR stands for do not resuscitate, and the call today didn't allow for um, the detailed conversations about all the different medical treatments that there are options for, but um, DNR stands for do not resuscitate or do not attempt resuscitation for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. If your heart were to stop, would you want someone to attempt resuscitation? There are a lot of myths around the success of resuscitation um, on television. Most people survive and, and go out to dinner the next day. Um, in reality, there are a lot of statistics that you can find going online and with um, a lot of the books that physicians are writing these days um, to raise awareness that especially for the frail elderly or the seriously ill, Cardiopulmonary resuscitation actually um, doesn't have the success rates that people expect. Um, the pulsed form is can be the equivalent for a do not attempt resuscitation or attempt it, and so those areas are on the pulsed. Um, you can also state it in your advanced directive, and in some areas there are still uh, separate do not resuscitate forms, although those are often now incorporated into the post. The question is, should you carry one for your 92-year-old aunt, um, or what form should I carry for her when we go out? So long as she can speak for herself, um, she needs to carry the form and you would carry a copy. I would suggest um, speaking to her doctor, and, and I'm not sure where you are in the country, so would uh, certainly double check um, but the, the post form and the advanced directive, it's a great idea to carry both 
um, with you, and you want to make sure that she has a copy. Any physicians in um, that is caring that are caring for her, and that you carry a copy as well. Um, can this be accomplished or included as part of a trust? Absolutely. Oftentimes it is done, although the medical decision making and the emotional and conversation aspects of this with family um, are often not covered when it's done in a legal setting. Um, and those things are key. I, I would just raise that um, knowing your medical decision making and getting in information about what would be best for you. Um, the process is often completed with attorneys, but they are not medical professionals to answer those questions. So I would just suggest you get additional information and also that you ensure the conversations happen afterwards. I can't tell you the numbers of people that have this in a, in a trust and their healthcare agent nor their family knows what they would, have, would want. And um, in an emergency, the attorney is not going to be the first person that's called about what kind of care or treatment to deliver. Um, if an advanced health care directive was done in 1996, is it still valid? If the content's still valid and your health care agent's still valid, it's still valid. Um, if your decisions have changed since then, you may want to update that. Um, no, you do not have to have a terminal illness to have any of these things completed. In fact, the goal is for the healthy public to have their advanced directives done. Um, the, uh, the new wave and documentation now states anyone 18 years or older. Um, the, uh, Ellen Goodman, who started the Conversation Project, said is it's only too early until it's too late. And we um, statistics show we're putting off doing this but we never know when there's a situation that we will need someone else to know what we would want for our care. So from 18 years on and older, um, you're a legal adult and these should be done when you're healthy um, and certainly if you're living with a serious chronic condition or terminal illness. Is the pulse recognized in states other than California? Um, I would Google whatever state you're in and put in Pulsed and see. Um, so not all 50 states have a recognized form um, that gives physician authority to do this for emergency circumstances. It's um, many do, but not all, and some have it under different names. So double check um, online or with your physician or healthcare service. Um, oh, sorry, as a follow up on that, would a uh, out of state form be recognized in lieu of a pulsed in California? That's a very tricky question, um, and so thank you, Kelvin. The, um, the physician is giving the order, and it's up to the emergency personnel in the area. This is one of those, and there are many gray areas around this topic. Um, so if you are traveling, and um, I would check with your physician, if there's a pulsed form, or a most form, it's really up to the emergency responders in the area that you're going to if they would um, honor that or not. I'm not sure that there's state to state legislation, but I am not the expert on that um, piece. Okay, thanks. Medic alert bracelet is probably a good way to go. What it would definitely show is that there was an intention behind that, but um, they need to be sure that it's a, a valid Pulse. So if you are traveling and your physician knows you're traveling and you have one, it may be a good idea to contact a physician in the area you're going to just to have a backup. Is it acceptable to have these forms in a USB just in case you get into an accident? Where does an EMT look for these if you're in an accident? Um, the EMT will look for a pulse in the pink form anywhere, that, but they have literally seconds. The, um, uh, the medic alert bracelets are another. Um, emergency personnel are also ongoingly being trained of where to look for these and different services are looking in different areas. So there are initiatives across the state and across the country to um, raise this profile with EMTs as well. Uh, medic alert bracelet 
is probably the the number one place an EMT would look for any medical um, any emergency medical information. But they do know in a home to look for the pink form on the refrigerator. Can we use the American or the Advanced Healthcare Directive found online? You can use any of them online. Yes. Um, so long as they are either witnessed or um, notarized. Uh, does California have a specific form or format to use? California uh, has probably 10 different formats, um, as do other states, and there are some federal. So the slide with multiple versions, um, there is no one form. I would double check. There is a California state legal form, but they're all legally valid so long as they are um, witnessed or notarized. I would absolutely check with your own insurer or healthcare system first and use whatever form they recommend. Um, if they don't have a recommended form, then you can use any of these and request it be put in your medical chart. Um, I'm in Canada, so some of the forms and procedures are different. I have to attend another meeting. Welcome Canada, and thank you. Yes, Canada does as a big awareness initiative. Internationally, there's an awareness initiative around um, advanced healthcare directives. Um, Yes, there's a suggestion to consider treatment for anxiety as well as physical pain, absolutely. Um, and some of the Go Wish cards that I uh, mentioned have uh, your wishes around anxiety, um, pain medications, reflecting back on personal experiences with people and what you found helped or what you wished they had. Um, is a great way to add things that are important for your advanced healthcare directive. Um, the uh, on our website with the Take Charge Toolkit, there are also the forms. Um, uh, there's a sample of the California healthcare directive there as well. If you are looking for that, um, I'm going through these rapidly. I hope this is all right. Um, there's you a question a about the post. Form. Go ahead, Calvin. No, no, go ahead. And after this, I have a couple of um, questions we submitted earlier that uh, I think would be uh, good to cover. But uh, yes, yeah, so the the pulse question. Wonderful. Um, and thank you all for your patience with how rapidly I'm speaking. This is something that we normally cover in a, a two-hour or four-hour uh, workshop format. So um, there's hopefully this is a taster, and and you'll be inspired to find out more as well. Um, can you complete a post while you're a healthy 56-year-old, for example? It was not developed for, um, it was originally developed for people living with a, a condition that they are currently under treatment and care of a physician for. Because of um, awareness and concerns around certain medical interventions in the case of an emergency, if you feel strongly about um, a care or treatment you might receive in an emergency situation that was life-threatening, you can certainly talk to your physician about that. Um, people, Some people do have them, some have trouble, uh, some physicians are not comfortable with that. Um, you have to understand that this is a very human decision that a physician is ordering someone not to attempt resuscitation on a healthy, otherwise healthy person. So um, that is a conversation between you and your physician. To that end, um, conversations with physicians around this topic, um, most physicians went into healthcare to save lives or improve lives, and it can be for some a very, uh, although it's important for all of us to have physicians aware of end-of-life care and um, supporting what matters for our care, um, not all physicians are comfortable having these conversations. Not all physicians are comfortable with the decisions that you might want honored, which is another reason to have a conversation with your physician to make sure that they would be on board um, with whatever you are choosing or at least have a discussion about that. If your physician is not comfortable with having that conversation you and you're concerned about the care or treatment you would receive, you definitely have the option to consider another physician, um, and you would want to do that prior to needing um, crisis or emergency care. Um, on that note, you can also choose any hospice, um, and um, certainly 
ask questions of hospice um, where hospice and palliative care specialties focus on the the care and treatment for people specifically at the end of life or um, during serious illness. There is a question about um, what about a patient with Alzheimer's? Can he or she do an advanced directive with the assistance from family? If someone still has the capacity to understand and make decisions for their themselves, Alzheimer's a diagnosis is not uh, would not prohibit someone from completing their own advanced directive. Um, but if they have are are not able to comprehend and are not able to make decisions for themselves. An advanced healthcare directive must be completed by someone with mental capacity. And this is where families get into um, really challenging circumstances. If someone is um, with one of the dementias, Alzheimer's, is not able to speak for themselves or is not able to comprehend, um, the family often can come together to uh, speak about and consider what would mom, dad, aunt, uncle have wanted, um, and coming together about that can be very helpful um, for whoever might be involved in decision making. But ultimately, the legal decision making um, goes to the physician in conversations with the family. There, there cannot. It's it's too late, unfortunately, if someone has not legally designated their advance. Um, their healthcare agent prior to losing mental capacity. There is an option on the POLST form in conversation with someone's physician um, to have family involved in the conversation about specific medical treatments in an emergency situation. So I would go to your physician and speak about the POLST form. And the Alzheimer's Association also has a lot more um, specific support and um, able to answer questions specifically for people with dementia and Alzheimer's, but it's one of the things that very few people understand and why it's so important to start these conversations earlier. Um, two last questions. There is, thank you so much, um, there is a note that there's an initiative in California to create an e post that an EMT personnel can access via looking at their smartphone. Um, thank you for that. There are also um, uh, programs that are looking at online access for advanced directives, um, databases, et cetera. So I'm sure that this area will continue to grow and expand um, as the need arises. Um, and uh, you can give a copy of your advanced healthcare directive to the hospice closest to where you live. Um, yes but they would only be able to accept it when you are their patient. So um, it would be premature to give your health care directive to the hospice, although you can name your, the hospice that you would prefer or that you do want hospice care in your advanced health care directive. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we'll go to just a couple of the questions received a little earlier um, through the registration forms. One listener would like to know how to choose a health care agent if they do not have any family or friends who they believe would be right, or maybe just they, they um, for whatever reason, they don't um, seem to be able to be comfortable with finding that person within their immediate um, family and friends. Great. Um, this comes up quite a bit. And um, I'll say first, don't assume. Um, and I don't, I don't know the the person that asked that question, but many people assume that a family member or friend would not want to do this or would not be able to, and um, we hear oftentimes people said, I, I wish someone had asked me, I, I would have wanted to help or uh, be involved in that. So one is don't assume, but secondly, if you know um, for whatever reasons um, that there isn't someone closest to you. Um, first, if you are a part of any uh, group, um, book club, uh, faith community, uh, imagine 100% of the population will need someone named as their health care agent, and there's an opportunity to open this conversation to um, start talking about how could people become health care agents for each other. And... Um, that sounds a bit radical, but I truly believe that um, more and more people will be doing that. Secondly, 
Um, there are you can hire a fiduciary. Um, there are state licensed fiduciaries. They are independent. Um, you would need to interview and meet with them. They have different processes around rates and and how they um, manage the process. But there are fiduciaries. Some are familiar with having a fiduciary for your financial affairs um, as someone that could be hired to do that. And there are fiduciaries that can also be um, named to be your healthcare agent. And they would they could take that role. But again, you would need to have the conversation. Make sure that um, they know what your wishes would be and how they could advocate on your behalf. Um, in lieu of any of those, naming on uh, completing your advanced health care directive and having a very strong conversation with your physician um, that you do not have a health care agent, but these are your wishes and values, and um, ensuring that anyone on your health care team um, that someone could be named to uh, have your forms pulled up and ensure that that process is as known as possible without having an absolute named healthcare agent. I hope that's helpful. Great. Um, we have another question from a listener who has an adult uh, daughter who is uh, disabled, just a physical disability, uh, who cannot physically sign, um, so she wouldn't be able to physically sign these forms. But she could uh, make a mark, uh, make her mark with a, with assistance. Would that uh, be a legally binding? Um, would that would that work for these um, these different advanced healthcare forms? Thank you so much for that question. I um, I would highly recommend taking the form into um, any. I don't know what the uh, the condition is or what uh, medical care her daughter may be under, but I would actually suggest taking the forms in with um, and have them reviewed with the uh, medical care team about what would be best in that circumstance. Um, I wouldn't have it just witnessed outside because she may need to have both the daughter's mark and um, the mother's signature. Um, but I'm not the expert in that arena, so I would double check. Perfect. Well, I think we have time for just two final quick questions. Um, one more um, reader question is they have a power of attorney for a family member, and they're still wondering if that um, they would still need an advance directive for that family member. Thank you. So um, there are actually uh, – there's – are two types of powers of attorney that people have, and it depends on what your power of attorney names you as. There's a power of attorney for finances, and there's a power of attorney for health care. The advanced health care directive, um, naming as a health care agent, is also known as the durable power of attorney for health care. So make sure um, that you're not only named for finances, um, just make sure which one you are named for. And finally, I know my colleague Christina at Family Caregiver Alliance always mentions, if someone is named as your financial durable power of attorney and you name someone else as your health care power of attorney, make sure they both speak and know what your wishes are because uh, the financial power of attorney might have different sense of what you would want and might be key to ensuring some of the care decisions you would want if there's a difference of agreement. So you want both or individual powers of attorney to know what's in both plans. Perfect. And then I think maybe for a last last question, we've you mentioned the statistics about lots of people recognizing the importance of advanced care planning, but many people not necessarily going and actually taking the, the steps and the conversations and having the uh, thinking through values and, and um, what they might want in terms of care. What would you recommend in terms of say someone who would um, want to get a, a loved one or a relative to have these discussions and um, get these forms filled out? Uh, what advice might you give them so they can, um, to give these family members um, advice on, on getting their friends, their spouses, um, their siblings to, um, to complete these advanced healthcare directives? That's a great question because um, those on the call uh, 
you might now be ready or have been ready, but you know that you're going to hit resistance when you try and raise this conversation with others. Um, they're, uh, they're very simple with the short time that we have left. There's a wonderful ABC video that Diane Sawyer did. If you Google it um, and look on the conversationproject.org website, um, and there's a short video clip of Diane Sawyer doing a national broadcast of a family having this conversation. Um, we show it in our workshops, and it's really about how you can start this with others. And finally, coming back to the very first slide, why does this conversation matter to you? Um, you will have your own very personal reason, and when you speak from the heart about this is important, um, Hopefully, you can raise that with those around you and start with those who were willing to talk first. Perfect. Thanks so much, Mary. I think that is all the time we have for today. Uh, unfortunately, Mary and I, we were kind of anticipating, not unfortunately, but we knew there's going to be lots of questions and probably not enough time to get through all of them. But um, you do have, let me bring that back up. You do have Mary's contact information here if you'd like to ask a question. Or if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Mission Hospice runs a number of workshops um, over the years. So it's always great to attend one of these um, uh, take charge workshops in person. As Mary mentioned, they're, they're longer and they're more of a workshop um, format. So there's more time to really get to, get in depth into a lot of the other um, questions. But uh, feel Thank free you, to- Thank you, Calvin. And I was just gonna say very quickly in hospice work, our whole focus is on what matters most to you, and that's ultimately what your advanced care planning is all about. So please um, do take this up and take charge of this area of your life and for those that you love. And thank you for your time on the call. Thanks. So again, um, feel free to reach out to Mary. Her contact information is there. I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar presented by Mary Matisson. These FCA webinars are a free and continuing series. And you can find more information about our next webinar on our website, caregiver.org. Uh, thanks again, Mary, for joining us today and sharing with uh, everybody your vast knowledge on the subject. Thank you, and thank you, Family Caregiver Alliance. We all work together to try and provide the best care. So thank you again. So the webinar is now concluded. We hope to see you all next webinar. And for those of you in California, we wish you all um, a, safe, um, a safe next couple of weeks during this wildfire season. Uh, take care and Absolutely. have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks everyone.